Yes, your host, Miller speaking. Welcome to another exciting episode of our Serene Football program here on YouTube and on SoundCloud. Um, before we start our show, of course, we want to uh, give actually a somber um, rest in peace to Zoltan Shavo, the head coach uh, to Sebastian Topol, who unfortunately passed away uh, late last night of apparent uh, heart heart issues or heart, some kind of heart heart issue went on with him. So, uh, horrible thing and thoughts and prayers are with his family and the show is in his honor because he's doing very well uh, for the Sitsa and he's also had a pretty excellent career in Serbia as a player as well. Uh, gone way too soon and rest in peace. Um, and uh, today's show we have some special guests uh, as always. Our man Luca back from DC, back from his uh, trip in Mexico. Luca, how was, uh, how was uh, the best part of the world? Yeah, hey man, it was a, it was great, man. Although, don't be telling people that I went to Mexico during COVID. There's a lot of haters out there, dude. <laughs> That's right. You're, uh, you're gonna be a wanted man. <laughs> That's right. Dude. They're hunting <laughs> me right now. Yeah. And and making his return to the show, our our man Valley finally. Valley, how you doing? They say in life, when you, you want things to go well, you need to prepare. For a footballer, a preseason is just important as the season itself. It's my week for slobber on Saturday, so I'm thinking about starting now so I can make a really good performance <laughs> by about Saturday afternoon. There you go. You'll be, you'll be in peak form in a couple of days. Uh, Alex, how are you doing tonight in Belgrade? Um, to quote a, a famous man who once said, uh, failing to prepare is preparing to fail, so I salute uh, Veli's, Veli's good attempts to, to get ready. Um, I'm doing okay. Kind of woke up in a, in a shitty mood, to be honest, considering the news. Um, very sad about Mr. Sabo. He was uh, one of the good guys of Serbian football and one of the, the good coaches. And um, hopefully people that, uh, that stay in Serbian football take on the fighting spirit that he had as a player and as a manager. And um, his life should be celebrated, not somber. That's, that's all I can say, but there are good news to look forward to, so uh, let's get into it. That's right. A lot of things to talk about this week. Um, a lot of uh, news, of course, so finally it's official. Uh, it was made official yesterday, Ljubica Tumbakovic is no longer uh, the national team manager. I think we all saw this coming. Um, not surprising at all, just surprising that it took so long for them to announce it. I guess last time his 120-page report saved him some a couple weeks, but at this time there was a no... Month's wages. It saved him a month's yeah. wages. <laughs> <laughs> there was no, no salvation this time around. Um, you know... He, he, I, we all knew he was going to get fired, and you know, I think it is the right decision in the end. But I think his tenure as Serbian manager was all right, all things considered. I mean, he came in at a terrible time, in a terrible spot. We're already basically out of qualifying. Um, he did. He beat Norway. We didn't think he, we, we would even win that game and, and be in position to go to the final of the playoffs. So. Um, he did some good things, you know. Our, the wins against Russia and Norway were our first wins against quality opponents in, in in a very long time. You know, two of those are probably two of the five biggest wins we've had in the last ten years, which is terrible, but it's, it's a fact. And uh, he he was he was the man that uh, achieved that. So it, he wasn't horrible. Um, he did an okay job, as we said before. He never had any issues with players. He wasn't in the public saying crazy things and making uh, stupid statements like our previous managers have done. So he's certainly a step up uh, compared to who we had before. But in the end, his main goal was to qualify for the Euros, and he failed. Um, and I think it is the right call that he was let go. Um, Luca, what are your thoughts on him officially being done, and, and, and what's next? Uh, yeah, man, I, I, I think... You know, Tumbakovic, by all accounts, is a decent man. Is a decent manager as well for Serbia. Um, I think where he messed up a little bit was the inconsistency, which saw us lose to Scotland in that game that we definitely should have won and and uh, would have been in the Euros. Obviously, would have been a different different uh, discussion we'd be having right now. But overall, um, ha happy with some of the stuff he did. Definitely not. We criticized him on this podcast before for some of the stuff he got wrong. Um, inconsistency killed him. And what's next of all the names that are being floated, like, you know, uh, who's it? Salah Milošević, Milojevic, and Pixie, who seems to be the favorite now. I think they're all an upgrade over Tumbakovic in their own way. I think Milošević is kind of the, the if we do get Sava, he'd be the person to um, fire up the players and, 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 and get them going in that way. As he's more of a, seems to be more of a man manager. Obviously, Pixie 
do, you know, he's got, I think his motivation would be right if he takes the job. And Milojevic, I think, would be actually my favorite of the three um, if we were able to get him, considering what he did with Viesda and, and uh, the professionalism that, that he approached the game with. So overall, I think all three are an improvement. If we get any three of them, I'll be happy with it. For sure. And uh, Veli, what are your thoughts? Was the, was the right call made to officially uh, sack Tumba? Listen, at the end of the day, there, there was I had that um, feeling there was something in me that I think this guy will do okay, um, and we talked about it on a previous uh, pod, but at the end of the day, it's a results-driven business, and he's going to be remembered as not taking us to, to the Euros, basically letting the game go for so long against Scotland. Yes, we got Scotland anyway because he absolutely got it right when it counted against Norway. But that inconsistency we talked about previously, the, I, I had, you know, I had good signs when, good feelings, I beg your pardon, when, you know, for instance, he did the whole fatherly figure type thing when he brought Luka Milojevic back um, because he left it when Kostage was there previously and he brought him back. And I remember some headlines in one of the papers was like, started like Luka Sina, you know what I mean? And so I think he had that bit of a father figure. But then I saw the warning warning signs when he used the, the League of Nations games as a, like a warm-up or a trial before the Norway game. And I didn't like that at all. I know my thoughts about trying to get a winning mentality and winning culture uh, to the team is really, really important, you know, in my personal opinion. But his, his time is going to be seen as below average. And that's just, that's just the way it is. I, I still scratched the hair that I have about a 120 page report. Good God, who could read that much? But anyway, um, uh, and who are we going to get? All those names, you know, I would think Salva Milosevic is on the bottom of that list of three that you had there. Right. Somewhere, Vlada Milojevic and, and um, uh, Dragan Stojkovic would need to be up there. This was, you know, like I missed a couple two pods and, you know, this was, you know, for instance, I would love to ask Alex this because he's our resident man in, in Belgrade, but... Um, we spoke about Venko Pavunovic before and uh, Ivic at Watford, um, you know, who are on great pay packets and it's highly unlikely they would actually leave and all that type of stuff because especially Venko Pavunovic had that um, legacy of being with the juniors. Alex, if I can lead you into this by asking you this question, one name that seems to be forgot is Ljubin Kodrolovic. What is his position anywhere near... Because he took up that under 19s that won the European Championship, and so he also has a legacy with the, with the youth players. Like, is is there an opportunity for him? You think, or anything like that? What is his name like um, around the uh, around the circles? I would say his name is um, in very low standard. Unfortunately, I think that um, his tenure with Partizan, I think, really really hindered him. Um, he took over in the middle of the group stage when we had a great chance to go through, and he had that very Terrible and negative performance against Augsburg. We had, I think, five guys on the bench. We had three attackers. He didn't use any of them. We had the opportunity to even lose and go through the knockout stages or to the knockout stages, and we lost 3-1. Um, some decisions he made didn't make sense. I think that his job with Macedonia and even Angola and a couple other teams wasn't really that great. I think that he um, would be a good addition to the coaching staff, but I'm not sure if he would be um, necessarily the right guy to lead a team. I think that it's been way too long to be any sort of continuation um, from the under-19 side that won uh, the European Championship into leading the, the national team spot. And um, I think that he didn't, I don't think his heart's even in it. I think he's kind of been all over the place. He's been a pundit. He's been here. He's been there. Um, he certainly has something to bring to the table. He's played in Portugal and played in many um, good teams. But I think that uh, for that position, he's not even in the top 10. When it comes to decisions, he had promise. I think that when he was manager of, for the national team for that short period before we got Tita Volka, he actually got us playing okay, but uh, he wasn't allowed to continue. I think that he missed his boat then, and uh, he's kind of an afterthought right now. And uh, as a good slug with to um, what is coming on, um, there was a great comment that was once made. Um, uh, that was in regards to... Uh, yeah, I guess that you can apply that to Timbakovic. Um, I think that's what my parents said when they gave birth to me. That's <laughs> what my parents said when they gave birth to me. But that's all right. <laughs> um, 
when you consider uh, some of the draws we've had at that position, I think Dumakovic did a lot of productive things. I can't sit here and say it was the wrong decision. I do say that I feel sympathy for him. I especially feel sympathy for him because, um, look, I, he's not – he would never have been my first choice, and I think the way he took the job was, was wrong, you know, leaving for the Kosovo game and all that, which we won't get into. Um, but the sports media and the media in general have made it about just the Scotland game and they've put all the blame on him. I think some of the analysis, quote-unquote, that have been thrown out there have been completely wrong, completely misinformed, and have put him – as a very um, stubborn and absolutely unprogressive manager when I actually think that he was a, an innovator in a way because he switched back to a formation that we went away from. He introduced a lot of guys that had key roles in the team and did a lot of other things that I think were good when we were on point and when we were playing well. We had some of our best performances in years and years. When we weren't good, we looked terrible. And ultimately, like you said, it's about results. He didn't get the right result. Um, I've said before that even Tossi didn't get the right result getting us to the Euros and he stayed on and I'm not saying that Timokovic would have been the ideal choice but I think there has to be some sort of system in place I feel somewhat sorry for him um, but at the end of the day he didn't accomplish what was asked of him and uh, you know the now, now there's a chance to really cut down and to really build some sort of a system and I think whoever comes in with the three options that were mentioned if they don't get a four- or six-year plan, at the very least, they have to stay. They have to stay until the end of the Euro 2024 qualifiers. Preferably, they would stay for even longer than that. But if we can't get a manager for more than two qualifying cycles, then we can have a committee of Marcelo Bielsa and Jurgen Klopp and you know Hansi Flick and whoever you want to bring up the names. Um, it's not going to do the job. I think of the three available options, um, I think Pixie might actually be the, the right one for the national team in the sense that I think in terms of the three, his tactics are probably the most debatable, but I think that, listen, Andre Shevchenko's tactics aren't exactly world-class, but he's got such authority and respect for the players, and he's played for so many good managers that he knows what he would do. Um, Pixie would have the ultimate respect of everybody, and he would be good for occasional meetups, not like a club where he would have to be there nonstop and you could get drained and stuff like that. I've said before, I think that of the available options, Milovic and Milosevic for a long-term plan, I'd like to see Salo as the sporting director because I think he could handle that well. Um, but like I said, I think without any type of a long-term plan and a guaranteed contract with some sort of a cause that, you know, some sort of, you know, that he can't get fired midway um, if, is necessary. Whoever we bring in, even if we bring in someone that we wouldn't like, uh, you can, if you even bring in a lot of these where you can like a secure contract, I'd actually be okay with that as to you're giving him time to build something. Um, whereas you can bring in you know, even Vinko Bonovic, if you just give him a two-year contract, it's it's not going to do anything. That's the key um, in this entire situation for me right now. Yeah, and, and we'll end it on on Tabak, which uh, he won't remember. He won't be remembered fondly, but I think he did a much better job as manager than most people who he had in the last ten years. And I think that does deserve did a much some better respect. Job, did a much better job than I expected him to. Uh, that, that yeah, exactly. And we saw him, you know, we saw players introduced into the team that had their best performances in a long time, like uh, Juricic, Juricic, SMS, Jovic, Radonic even. So he's, he definitely made somewhat of an impact. Of course, it didn't end well, and we're all going to remember that the most. But I would like to thank him for the work he did, even though it didn't turn out. Um, I, won't, I don't hold anything against him. I think he made a lot of mistakes in the, in the most important game. But all in all, he did an okay job, and it looks like he's already found a new job. It looks like he's going to get a job in the Chinese league now. So all the best luck to him, and he was very professional the whole time, and uh, have no Ill, Ill, Ill feelings towards him despite failure. And now, yeah, as we've been saying uh, the show, uh, the reports are now that uh, Dragan Pisi Stojkovic is uh, the favorite for the job. It was uh, with Vucic today in India. They were opening up a Chinese tire factory or something. Um, and it's reported that he's the number one pick of the president as well as uh, from people in FSS. Seems like he's always been a candidate uh, for every time there's a new manager, which is pretty often a discussion of a new manager. He's one of the candidates, and now maybe he'll be ready to take on the role and the responsibility. The one thing I'll say about Pixie is yeah, his record – as a manager, isn't that amazing? He has had, had some success, but not a lot of success. And, you know, any of all his success and all his coaching has been in Japan and China. So 
that as well works against him. But he is someone who knows what the national shirt means. He knows uh, what the pressure is like. He has been in the biggest games ever in our national team's history. If you think about World Cup 1990, uh, World Cup 1998, Euro 2000, he's one of the last players uh, that we had to actually make it to a, to a group stage uh, elimination, to make it out of the group stage and go into an elimination game. I mean, he was in the last one that we ever had <laughs> because we haven't made out of the group stage in, in 20 years, right? So he's someone that knows what's expected of someone that wears a national shirt and I think he would be somebody who would hold who would hold the players accountable, who make it very clear, and he would set a great example for them. And I think someone like that would be of a massive help because a lot of our players, um, you know, things in the past have not been always the most professional in the national team, and we haven't always seen that spirit and that and that uh, togetherness and cohesiveness. And I think someone as experienced as Pixie could potentially bring that out of a side. Um, Luke, what are your thoughts on, on, on the three options we have? Of course, I, I think I, you know Salman Lushi said to mention as the as the backup choice in case right. we can't get Milovic or or uh, Pixie. But in reality, I think he's, he's I don't think he's ready for this job. I think he should have stayed with Partizan. I, I, I think it's a stupid stupid decision for Partizan to fire him because he was showing some promise and he should have been allowed to develop there instead of being fired. And I, yeah, I don't think he's ready at all to be uh, taking over a national team at this stage yeah i i, I agree with that man I, I would say that um you know M- M- sabo would be you know choice number three out of the three um but i do like him in the sense that i think he could really connect with the players because he's not you know that old and i think the players would definitely respect him and i think he, he could get him fired up to play uh, in a way that we haven't seen before um, num- my number one choice of the three would be uh, Milojevic, just for a simple reason, because I think uh, he has a great record with Zvezda. It seems to be extremely professional in what he did, and you know, and and, and with the highlight being uh, beating Liverpool in the Champions League. Um, so I think that professionalism is something we are starving for in the national team, and and I would love to see that as with. As with Pixie, it would mean more of a wild card for me because I would just need to see what he could do with the team. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be here and say that um, you know, he's gonna do a great job and I'm expecting great things. I would just if if he's hired, great, give him a few games, let's see what happens. Um, but I'm not ready to toot his horn just yet. So in order, Milojevic, Pixie, Milosevic. That would, that's where I'm at. Really, I know you spent some uh, time with uh, Pixie back in your day when he was doing his tours in Australia. Um, what are your thoughts on, on him potentially taking over? And, and do you think this is something that he'd want to do? Or do you think these reports have any, any bearing in honesty? This is the part, like, so as you guys know, I'm like 97 years of age, right? So um, I Pixie was the person that I grew up with. You know, when, when he was at Zvezda, when he went to Marseille, when he went to Verona, uh, when he had that massive injury, um, when, when he was playing for Yugoslavia, that, you know, like, Dragan Stoikic was everything to me, being a young teenager growing up. He was the man that I wanted to be um, as a shitty footballer and then, more importantly, you know, as, as a person because I just, you know, when you're, when you're 16, 17 years of age, you see his class, his style and all that, and, you know, it's something that you look up to. I remember um, having a 1984, now you kiddies are probably too young to remember this, but there was an old magazine in the ex-Yugoslavia sports magazine that Temple. came out every weekend, Tempo, right? And I had him, he was a front cover of a 1984 when he was playing for the youth team, and he signed it for me, amongst other things that he had. So he resurrected his, he didn't resurrect it. He went to, he, he took a career choice to go to Japan where he extended his playing career and that was really, really smart. Obviously, he followed in the footsteps of people like Gary Lineker, Zico, um, that great Brazilian um, midfielder and became an, I had iconic status in, uh, in Japan and then obviously tried to, explore his own frontiers and taking up a job in china thereafter let's be honest the money helps um but i I know that you know he still has uh, a property in paris 
and he infrequently visits um, Serbia and every every now and then he um, uh, has something to say about the state of Serbian football. Now to every time he has something to say every time I fail. <laughs> yeah. So um, the thing so this is the this is the thing to me. I would love to see him there. The question that I have for someone like Pixie was that, okay, we all remember that he got great, um, a great uh, reference from people like Arsene Wenger, you know, that he could possibly be the man that would go to Arsenal. And at the end of the day, that just turned out to be fodder for, for journalists. Um, there have been various openings at Marseille. There were very, there, you know, there was that possible half chance opportunity at uh, Arsenal. And the big thing that I had with Dragan Stojkovic was that why didn't he test himself in the cutthroat European managerial scenario rather than a little bit more safer as he as he's in in Asia. Um, you know, obviously I'm from Australia. Asia is our confederation. It's right in front of our doorstep. And so I would even have a little bit more, um, you know, exposure to what he does because Australian clubs play in Asian um, club competitions. That's my big thing with Dragon Slow Pitch. I'm just wondering why he never took up more of a cutthroat uh, position to um, manage in Europe. Vladan Milojevic, I've always had a massive regard for because I think he could be the person that breaks the mould of that, um, what, I've, what we've all talked about on previous pods, tai stari mentalitet or bivši goslovenskog footballer. And I reckon he could break that mould. I, you know, if I can recall, it was an interview or whatever it is before, he says, I hate our mentality. I can't stand it. Do you know what I mean? Like, and so I'm thinking that he could break the mould for that and, you know, probably revive um, the, the national team and... Uh, you know, I, I massively agree with with all your three. Like, just just give him some time. For God's sake, give him some time. We are obviously not as good as what we think we are. We have wonderful players, but there is something wrong with the setup. Again, we don't want to bore anybody listening to the pod, but um, I think that he could be the person that could break that mould. I agree with that. Um... I, I guess it's, it's, it's my turn. Um, it's it, listen. I will never say no to Bixi. Um, he is one of the greatest players that this country has ever produced. He's somebody who, um, from a cutthroat perspective, was president of the FA and was president of Zvezda. So I guess you can say that he tested himself in those waters and had mixed results. Um, the issue is, listen, I'm not going to sit here and act like some sort of genius as far as what he can do and what he can play, because I've barely seen Japanese teams that he's coached, whether it was Nagoya or Guangzhou or Grande. I know that he lost more at Guangzhou than he won. Um, I know that he also had a wage packet that was amongst the highest in, um, in, all, of, in all of the world. He's like amongst the 10 most paid managers in the world. So um, when you're making that kind of money, you know, it's, it, it's hard to say no to that. Um, there have been all kinds of stories, both positive and negative, both great and, and terrible when it comes to him as a person. He's very very much a wild card, as you would say. Um, but I, I've always considered the Japanese a decent judge of character. And if he is treated like royalty there, which it is, it's, it's good enough for me. He would have the ultimate respect of every one of those players because if Pixie comes to you, you're not going to say no to anything. Um, he is financially and personally, I would hope, I would hope, I, I can't say he is, but I would hope, um, established enough where he wouldn't take crap from the non defunct factors that uh, come in and that try to tell him what to do. What he's like tactically, it's total football. It's very much the Arsene Wenger school, which was very much attacking and dare I say, possibly a bit outdated. I don't know because I, I can't judge him because of that. Um, if you ask me, I, I, I think that there would be other options. I've said before that Vega Bonovic or Yukarlis would be my number one choices because both of them would have great rapport with the players. Um, I don't know what the rapport with Milovic would have, although I think he is by far the best tactician of the three. I don't think there's even a debate about that. Um, people can have their say, but the way that you saw to go into those games was that they were never unprepared and I think that like I said he's 50 so it's kind of the right time maybe for him to take over I know it would be the right time for Pixie as well where he can be manager and then live a comfortable life completely out of the public spotlight um, 
it, it, I, I'm not sure what to say except the fact that you should give in time. I think that the I'll say the bigger issues at hand are what's going to happen with the FA. Are there going to be serious changes? Um, is there something going to happen, which I doubt anything will happen in terms of the uh, upcoming uh, votes that are going to demand who's the president and who's not. Um, but it, it comes down to principles more than it comes down to people. It comes down to systems more than it comes down to individuals. You let people do their job, and you let them go out and build a team that they think they should build. And I, I guarantee you that you will see results, because I think we have the players that can compete and it's about maximizing potential, which we haven't done. So that's what I'm hoping for. And the last thing, it comes to Salvo. Um, I think that the, that the issues that I saw was that, that once uh, his main assistant, uh, Milan Jurekic, who was or is the current Radic Kanish manager, he was in his coaching setup last year. And last year, but these looked fantastic and looked the best that I've seen this look in 10 years. Once he left, of course, the issue of Radovan Churchill coming in is, is like a plague because wherever Radovan Churchill shows up, that team becomes terrible. We know that. We know that from personal experience. But he came in, and we looked so much worse at the start of this year. Um, he got sacked, and I think deservedly got sacked, and I think he got exposed for not knowing a lot of things. And I think that um, the, the national team job is more forgiving when it comes to that because it's more motivation and, and individual talent and basic organization and some in-depth principles. But Sabo is a man of in-depth principles, and Sabo is a man of, of bigger things, and I'm not sure how he would function when it comes to that kind of stuff. So I would I would agree on the order. Um, I'm not sure what to say. I mean, obviously, the, the, it's very sad that the Vidic letter and the other things didn't have much of an impact, it seems. Not that we expected it to have impact, but um, I'm, I'm just hoping that Pixie comes in and takes it seriously and gives the, the, the psychological boost that we need. I also hope that the people don't come in expecting us to be Ghostbusters and young guns blazing and everything like that. It's going to take time uh, for him because he hasn't managed in Europe ever, and he hasn't been with our players ever. So, you know, he hasn't been with our players at least in terms of 15 years in terms of being around them. So, like I said, give him time, let him do his job, and, and see what happens. And if that fails, then we might as well pack up and go home, but at least we can go and say we tried and we gave it an honest effort. So. Yeah. Boys, you know what I'd like. You know what I'd love to see. Sorry, Milosha. You know what I'd love to see a, a decent team put together in terms of the coaching staff, right? So you can't just throw the job to Milovic or Stojkovic or Paunovic or you know Jokanovic and say here take it over. Like, can I, you know? I'd love to see in a situation where he has the team around him that he wants. The team around him then expands to the under 18s and the under 20s and all that. So they're looking after the present and the future in an organized, structured way and to show some type of continuity. So it's not just who's going to be the, the, the manager, because if it's like that, might as well ask for do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, like, can he get, can he, whoever goes, can they get the proper team coaching infrastructure around them? Not only for the art of Prestatia, but for everyone else underneath to make sure they're all going in the same direction. That's a Sorry, great point. That's a great point. I would also add, I mean, that you can see great examples in modern football, I would say, just to quickly point that out, why Veli is right. Assistants matter a lot. We saw the Liverpool, if you ask Jurgen Klopp, yeah, he's he's the manager and he's in charge of the way they play, but the tactical prowess comes down to Pep Linders and other guys. The same thing comes down to, you know, Guardiola and his team with Mikel Arteta, who was his right hand man and you know, even in Bayern, Hansi Flick was the guy who was helping give Henkes when they won the, the Champions League. He was with the Bayern B squad. So the coaching staff is much more important. I'm sure that in the backroom staff and the sports analytics staff, uh, there are people that can do that job well. I think from that perspective, we are terribly outdated because I don't see, you know, somebody said that there are six, you know, six division teams in England that have like 20 games of every opponent and they put them all together in like a presentation for an hour and then the manager takes that hour and tells it all to the players in five minutes. I don't see that type of process with us. And that's exactly one of the things I'm talking about is that it all seems to be on individual motivation and hard work. It doesn't seem to be a system in place where, okay, we're going up against the perfect example of that was when we went to the world cup, when we're going up against um, Brazil and Switzerland and Costa Rica, and we're going up against Nigeria, Morocco, and Bolivia. Like we're not going up against the same teams or the same quality or the play style. None of that exists. It's just individual effort and individual brilliance and motivation that leads us there. And that's why I'm hoping that the coaching staff can come in. And I'm hoping that other people that would be willing to take the job will take And I think there are competent people in the coaching staff. Like Zona Filippo, which used to manage. As a manager, he's one of the 
the main scouts there. Last one, she can do a good job. Ilya Stolitsyn, who's just stayed as the under-18 manager, correct me if I'm wrong, Mel, she's, she's staying 21. around. 21. So the, the, the abilities exist there. Um, so it, it, it comes down to building up a good staff and a good system and actually increasing the manner in which we operate and just increasing our general awareness of the game. I don't think that we're aware of the modern trends that are existing in football, and I don't think that we've done a good enough job of scouting ourselves. I don't think we've done a good enough job of scouting our personal talent and our personal ability, or looking in the past and say, this is what's made a player good, this is what's made a player bad. These are the physical traits, these are the technical traits. We haven't gone in depth on that, and in order to do that, you have to have a good coaching staff, not just a good manager. A manager can motivate a good player, but it's, it's all down to one guy. If you want to be successful consistently, you have to have a system. For a system, you need multiple people, which is so crucial in the coaching staff. I just wanted to say that Veli is right on the money when it comes to that. Sorry for... For uh, sure. No, it's okay, for sure. And I would just say uh, one final thing about that is whoever the new manager is, they have to announce that it's a long-term deal just for just to show the fans, just to show us that they're trying something different. It has to be announced as a minimum four-year deal. Like They can't come and do another one of those, you know, for the qualifiers, we'll see how it goes type of deals that everybody's getting. Like, this has to be a substantial deal for many years, and it has to show, it has to be a plan as well. They should present us of a plan just to show us that they're going to try something different because what we've been doing the last 10 years has not been working, and clearly a years. new approach. Last 30 exactly, years. A, new, a new approach has to be tried out, and this is the time to do it. I mean... We have a great generation of players coming through. We don't want to waste it, as we wasted so many generations. And the final word on Pixie, I mean, he's somebody who has, every time we have failed, he has been one of the first people to offer a comment and say something. If you guys remember in the 2006 World Cup, you know, when he famously trashed uh, uh, the Pet Coach for calling up his son. And in the media, I mean, this is, this is his chance now to put his, uh, put his money where his mouth is. If, let's see if he can do a better job, and hopefully he's up, up to it, and hopefully he is the one who gets the job. I wouldn't mind him or, or Milovic. I think it would be a huge step forward in terms of quality and in terms of uh, respect when it comes to someone that's managing our team. And uh, with one of them, I think we have a strong chance of doing better and actually building something towards the future instead of just randomly trying things and, and giving up on them You know, after a couple of months like we do every time. Um, let's uh, step away from the national team for a moment and uh, focus on the Europa League. Uh, the draw was yesterday, or was it not yesterday, Monday, and as they got a pretty, uh, pretty tough opponent, <laughs> AC Milan, which is coincidentally having their uh, you know best season in, in about a decade or so. Um, currently with uh, Zlatan, of course, in, in the Serie A. Um, very, very difficult draw. I don't think you'll find many people who are predicting this as a chance in this one. Uh, but anything can happen. Boys, boys, did any of you guys, you guys, you know, it's daytime for you guys. It was the middle of the night for me. Did any of you guys go with as soon as they drew AC Milan? Did any of you guys say, Oi, yeah, Ben, be Michael. Like, of all the teams they could have, like, they, all the teams they could have drawn, it was it. Because, like, it was just, sometimes the draw's got to be a bit of luck. And although it's a... <clears throat> draw that suits Zvezda due to the fact is that we've got long histories there. Um, uh, here's, a, here's a fun fact for you guys. You know that famous, uh, you guys probably heard the story, but you know the famous when um, Zvezda played AC Milan uh, and the lights went out. So you guys have mm -hmm. heard that story before? So one of the guys at midfield is Milan Ivanovic. He lives here, here in Adelaide and I know him really, really well. And he can tell you that story over and over again. So we have massive history with playing against Milan. And, but again, I screamed out that, you know, swear word in the middle of the night when I woke up and checked my phone. So I don't know if you guys did it in your various places, but jeepers, sometimes luck doesn't go against you. Yeah, no, no, no luck at all on that one. I think everyone was hoping for a much easier side. Uh, but uh, one end of the thing, though, I mean, AC Milan is in the middle of a title race right now. And this is their best chance to win a title in a long time. So there's something to say for them possibly being distracted by the Serie A season uh, once it's time for, for the games we've played in, you know, closer to, to the fall, to the springtime. So that is one possibility. And, yeah, I mean, and also Zvezda's been doing pretty well 
Didn't, didn't excellent in the group stage, looking good in the league. Anything is possible, but it will be very, very difficult. It is a tall task. Uh, Luca, what were your thoughts on the draw, and, and what do you think we can get out of this one? Uh, you guys may think I'm crazy, but I think this is a, this is a great draw for Zvezda. Uh, for the, you know, obviously there's a historical fact. I think I, I think it'll actually be a pretty close matchup. Because, and, and I say that because of the inconsistency of AC Milan. Um, I mean, I, like just looking at the draw, it's like, there, there were definitely a lot tougher teams there than AC Milan, who I definitely wouldn't have wanted to get drawn up uh, against. And um, so I don't, I don't see it as that bad. Obviously, easier teams as well. But what can we get out of it? I mean, I think we're not going to go through. <laughs> but for me, the the deed has already been done. I think this team getting out of the group was the goal, and I think they've done that, and, I, and they did it in a spectacular fashion. Now the only thing I can ask for... Uh, as a supporter of the of the club is hey can you know let's put up a fight against them and let's just see what happens let's throw you know not caution to the wind but let's be smart about it but let's see what happens agree. right absolutely say Tommy just say ah oh, fuck it every now and then and let's go you yeah know what I mean? absolutely agree yeah no no exactly man so that's why I actually kind of like this and I'm you know fingers crossed that we're gonna have fans there it's not looking good obviously because you know it's in February they're playing these ma- uh, matches so. That would be a very, very big advantage to us. But given the inconsistency of AC Milan and given the fact that they are going for a, a title race, um, there could be a silver, li- silver lining there for Zvezda. This is where we see what Dejan Stankovic is really made of in how he approaches this game and what results we get out of it. Like I said, I'm already happy with what this team has achieved, and I'm, I'm going to be kicking back and watching this game uh, not as nervous as I would be for the group stage games, for example. So I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> exactly. And, and I think you, you're right. I mean, how can anybody be upset about this run? Uh, five games in a row unbeaten in Europe. That's amazing for any team, let alone uh, let alone team from Serbia. Um, so amazing season by Stankovic and his team. And whatever happens against Milan, I don't think anybody will be upset. And hopefully uh, Zvezda can put up a good fight and, and you know make, make this interesting at least. And, uh, yes, a lot of history in this tie. Of course, we all remember 14 years ago, 2006, when, uh, you know, they were banned from the Champions League. They had that big points deduction. And then as the weeks went by, the, the points deduction kept getting smaller and smaller as the bribes kept getting larger and larger. And then eventually they were able to <clears throat> take part in the qualifying and, of course, pieces over two legs. Um, and, uh, yeah, un- un- unfortunate memory and an un- on fond memory, but hope this time it's a chance for revenge. Alex, uh, so what are your uh, thoughts on the draw and uh, on Zvezda's chances? To respond to uh, Valley, I didn't say Yebim Timaiko, I said Yebim Timaglu. That's, uh, <laughs> that's pretty much where we're at right now. Um, somebody wrote a pretty good comment. I mean, he said, I was I was convincing myself that Blago Yergiev and Dushan Basta and Ibrahim Guy could knock out Kaka, Kafu, Maldini, and Clarence Seydorf. So <laughs> if you think, if I could convince myself of that, I can convince myself of anything. Um, <laughs> It's it's okay. Um, listen, there are teams that listen. Let's be honest. Zvezda, the outsider, whoever they would have drawn, except for maybe Club Bruges, they would have been the outsiders in in the in the draw. I mean, let, let's no disrespect, but it's just how it is. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, absolutely. You consider the fact that there are teams that don't listen. Star power matters to us. Uh, we like to motivate ourselves for the big opponents and for the for the for the big ties. It doesn't get bigger than AC Milan, not just because it's the biggest club left. Seven European titles, so many great players. You know, I have the the Opel Milan kit somewhere with with Kaka's name on it, the gold font. It's like the best kit ever made. Um, The history, not just with the game that was canceled due to the fog, the UEFA Mafiosi uh, TIFO, which we nearly forgot to mention, um, the whole nine yards, um, it, it motivates you. It, it gets you going. You know, Zvez is kind of a, tries to be at least like a romantic club. You live in the past. Remember all those good times you used to have. Um, there were teams where you could have gotten like Shakhtar or Villarreal or even Dinamo, you know, who are not as attractive, as meaningful and yet you know that they're going to take it seriously and that they're much better than you because that's Europe is it for them. You know, even for Roma and Napoli, Europe is it for them. They're not making it to the Champions League for their domestic leagues. They're going to play Europa seriously, and they're way better than you. And it's like you get knocked out the shack, darling, or Villarreal. Like, I mean, what? It, it's just stupid. There's just no there's no benefit to it. Um, and if, if even if you get Tottenham or Man United, first of all, you've seen those teams before in recent times, and they're so strong and they're so deep that they can put out their mixed, you know, 
B team and they could still beat you. I mean, Spurs beat Zvezda 9-0 last year in two games with a mixed squad and Man United beat Partizan 4-0 in two games. So it, Milan is at that point where, yes, this is the best season they've had in 10 years. Um, Zlatan is a, a god. The dude is 40 and is legitimately one of the best strikers in the world right now. He's incredible. And it's not just him, though. They've got a whole host of extremely talented players. Jan Spetterhaugen, the guy that they signed from the Bodo Glimt, is, is an elite finisher. The guy is one of the best long-distance shooters I've seen in a long time. Hakan Chalkanoglu, fantastic free kick taker. They've got Donnarumma, one of the better goalkeepers in the world who's still ascending. And they've got Dave Hernandez. They've got Bulldogs in midfield with Frank Kessie and Ben Asser and guys like that. But their squad is not so deep where they can come out with a combined mixed team and, okay, it's, it's done. No, but there's, there's a chance here. Um, I think that the Scudetto for them is very much a possibility. The Juventus have been a complete mess since Pirlo has come in. I think that the Champions League is their main priority because if they don't win it now with Ronaldo and Buffon and Chiellini and all these guys, I don't know when they're going to win it. Um, I don't expect Milan to win the title, but I certainly don't expect them to be out of the title race by February. The fixture list works for Zvezda in the sense that the intergame that Milan's been playing against Inter Milan is sandwiched between the two Europa ties, so they're going to be kind of stretched out. Milan doesn't have 25 good players. They have maybe 15 or 16 good ones. And listen, you're going into that game. It's an Italian team. Our teams have decent records against Italian teams. Um, the last manager to knock out an Italian team or put off a big win was uh, Walter Zing against Roma. Says that has an Italian, basically, a manager who knows how to play against Milan because he's beaten them before as a player. So there's a hope for it. At the end of the day, even if they get knocked out, but like I said, they did what they had to do. Um, they got out of the group, which is a huge thing for them. And you want to play against AC Milan and, and Man United. You don't want to play against freaking Shakhtar and, right. you know, Rangers and all due respect. I'm not saying that they're, they're bad teams or small clubs, but like you want to go up against the big boys, and, and that's what you play football for. Um, I'm expecting the fans. I think the fans will be allowed, although I do expect there to be a significant um, support at San Siro. And also, um, listen, Rio Ave nearly knocked Milan out in the, the playoff round. Milan won through on penalties. Spot the Prague beat them three 0 in the group stages. So stranger things have happened. I'm not saying that there's that there's much of a chance, but there's a chance. I think that there were teams that Zvezda would have gotten where no matter what the situation would have been, barring a massive COVID outburst, they would have been okay. They're done. They got no shot. They're not beating them. Doesn't matter who plays how. They're done. Lock and change in the transfer window. I wouldn't be surprised if Zvezda loses somebody. Um, so we'll see. But like the Jim Carrey uh, gif. Uh, there is a chance, and that's more than they could have hoped for. It's a big tie. It's going to be exciting. I think it's historically the biggest tie that there is along with Benfica and Arsenal. So, I mean, why not? You know, you, you go for it. It's, it's, in our, it's in our code to uh, go out and uh, die in a blaze of glory, and I guess that, uh, this is going to be a similar case, and you never know what can happen over, over two legs. So, so we'll see, but it's, it's going to be exciting for sure. I love a spectacle, and Zlatan in Belgrade is definitely a spectacle. Um, and I'm sure we're all looking forward to that. Of course, it won't be the same without a full stadium, but it'll be amazing nonetheless. And uh, when it comes to the knockout stages, it's better to play against an attractive opponent than someone that even if you you know beat, it's not going to be that <laughs> big of a story than as AC Milan coming to Belgrade and, and a massive club like that, that history, as well as the history between the two clubs, which goes without saying. And uh, just to uh, wrap up the show today, Valley. I know your boys, uh, Belgrade, from, Belgrade from Adelaide, uh, had a tough loss in the grand final. Um, any, any, uh, well, give us a little match report, uh, a little standard yeah. report as well, how everything yeah, went for you guys. Um, so, it might sound that I'm ultimately out of this world without compromised bias, but why wouldn't I be? Do you know what I mean? So if I could just set the, set the picture for you, um, again, and I hope I don't bore anybody, but I know that, you know, that there are some listeners to the pod who are gen generally interested in the history of our, the Aspoda and what they've done and achieved and all that type of stuff um, throughout the world. Belgrade was formed in 1949, um, so we've been around for, the, this is our eighth decade. Um we are traditionally what they call a first division club, or like I'll just use the modern terminology, National Premier League Club 1 here in South Australia, and we were gunning for promotion. We finished fourth, but we made it to the playoff final. We are known for our support, and we are known for the people who st still come out because 
Um, there are you know volunteers there who are well in their aid. So there's there was three volunteers in our uh, you know Nekomoyalaka uh, Zemnia Chukubato left us, but um, uh, two left who are in their eighties and they still mark our pitch. So Chico Yowo and Michael Marco, uh, they they still mark the pitch every home game. That's how much it means to them. Um, we have you know the massive band of volunteers and we just um, we live for that every week. We the club makes a lot of people's weekends. They make a lot of people happy. So we reached the playoff final, and again, you know, people who live overseas might laugh, laugh their heads off. Um, uh, we average probably anywhere between five and seven hundred people for a normal home game. Um, we have fantastic cuisines: Petrosa Travapa, Pleskalitsa, Yantsev, you know, Prasatino, uh, you know, on most home games, and we love it. So we got to the final. The the federation that, or the football association that runs um, South Australia and in most states in Australia just basically got no idea, right? So now due to the COVID situations whereby we haven't had an active case in about a month, they decided to book tickets online and they capped it at 1,000. That sold out in four hours. You know what I mean? Nice. So, um, and they were the majority of were supporters of Belga. They increased it to uh, two thousand. It sold out within the next day. People came out of the woodwork, and um, and obviously the loyal week to week supporters that were there um, uh, just came out came out and supported. You know, one of those big days. So it's 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 our historical thing. So we talked about Zvezda before in European competitions. We are used to Belgrade being in the in the first league, and we are used to you know those big match days, the cup finals, the championship playoffs. You know, finishing first, um, the competition, best and fairest winners or best MVPs, as you guys call it in North America. We are just used to that history. Now, um, unfortunately, it didn't it didn't go our way. Um, we just I think we played our final the week before. We did lose um, two nil and. That's just the way, that's football. Thought the sport, then that's just the way it goes. To pay tribute to the people who make our club, people people went on a Thursday night after the final to our club, you know, the Sapofia Koi Pietri Takwadalia. It's a working night, so it was a Thursday night in Adelaide. The last person left at quarter to five in the morning. Nice. That's how much. That's how much you know it means. People were sitting there drinking. The players came back. All the supporters gave them, you know, a warm round of applause. Now we're not into glorious defeats. You know, we're a club of winners that are just on the hard times uh, at the moment. And so, if I give you a context, the NPL one final playoff final. So that was on the night before, um, the night after. I beg your pardon. They uh, had just under 3,000 people that went to that final. There is strong rumours by everybody. Adelaide is a small place. It's only a million people. The football community is even then smaller. There is strong rumours that the Football Association of South Australia probably gave 1,500 tickets away. So um, Belgrade in the second division got a lot more fans than they did in the first. And they, I think our allocation of free tickets was about 30. And 2,000 people turned up. So, uh, yes, we have ferocious support. Um, I send you guys the videos. Not, I send them out of pride. I'm not going to lie to you. I send them out of great pride. Um, you know that I've sent the scarves to you guys and things like that. I just love to... I just love to spread the word. You know what I mean? We look at, you know, uh, what it was in... Is it Toronto, Milosha? I can't remember, but... Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we all that that you know we we love that stuff. We love that stuff. You know, I've showed you my white was jacket from Johannesburg, and 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 um, you know, like I'll, I would just love to have a you know collection of that that type of stuff, but bit by bit, day by day. So the boys didn't give up. The boys did us proud. They probably played their final a week early because they beat the top team uh, three one away, uh, going down to ten men. And they were one nil down. They come up in the second half and put three past them, and um, so we probably played our final. Then Yabiga Totia Sport, and we're gonna go go around next year and, and see what we can do. We've got and funny thing is, not it's not a funny thing, but your pardon. 
we got three or four young Serbian kids that play. They love it. And, you know, like, let's just, you know, wish them all the best for next season. Beautiful. I love it. Um, a great example for all, uh, not even Serbian clubs, all clubs in the world. You guys have such amazing support. Uh, more more, more fanfare and attendance than 80% of uh, Serbian Super League clubs, <laughs> which is to go without saying. Um, like, Miloska, I'll never forget this, buddy. Sorry, man, like, I, I beg your pardon. I'll never forget this. So I had a, a, now a relative, he's now a relative that came over, and we play night games under lights at our own ground. And he goes, but yeah, but we're going to go to Serbia, right? <laughs> right. I mean, like, some of those Vezda Partizan, you know what I mean? And, you know, like, it's whatever it is, the 250 lux, I don't know what that bloody means, but uh, you can see us from an aeroplane, and... Um, uh, that we, we just we just love it. Yeah, I'm out of this world biased, but for that reason, I I um, uh, I we all here pay attention to what White Eagles are doing in Perth, what Avala are doing in Sydney, what um, Sindrilich are doing in Melbourne. We love it, and you know we're we're, we're never ever going to shy away from the fact is that we love it, and so long may it continue. And 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 them, and Milos, and them boys have a uh, support on the other side of the world in DC. I got the jersey, I got the scarf. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Hell yeah, Milos, yours is in the post. Alex, I'll call Borg now. You'll give me your address, brother, so he'll come your way. Too. <laughs> no, I'll, be proud, I'll be proud. Mail, I'll be proud to wear it. <laughs> boys, can I'll I just have one quick shout out before we, before we leave? Um, we've yeah. got an active, uh, we've got a fantastic listener, uh, active listener to the pod in. Um, San Francisco, Marco Ristich, good mate of mine who um, I met a number of years ago. He actually is a contributor to the Red Star Belgrade uh, Forum, um, so that web- website. So get onto that, guys. He writes really, really well. Um, and, you know, for Zvezda supporters out there, you can get your fix, not just football, like Koshar Kali, Ostale Sportovi. So it's a great read, and I, uh, I know that he's an active supporter of our pod, so I think we should just give him a shout out. And uh, if you guys get time, uh, go in there and have a look. Oh, I've definitely read his stuff before. That's amazing. Yeah, great insight and always always um, a lot of good things and, and a lot of uh, breaking news as well uh, on that forum. So that's pretty great to hear. And a shout-out to him, of course. And a big shout-out to our uh, team from Adelaide uh, next year. Definitely getting promoted. Unfortunately, this wasn't the year, but uh, but uh, next year it's going to be the year. And I think there'll be even, hopefully there'll be even more people at the game, right, Valley? When the next that's your grand final that's your comes around. That's right. Gotcha, uh, everyone, thanks for a great week and an amazing show. And we look forward to hear, seeing and listening to us uh, next week as well. Take care.